Now this slot with the half inch goes all the way through. After that, that's when we'll make the shoulders on either side. So it's touching, zero. Let's do 40 thou after we unlock our X. There's our work stop. So that's another 60 thou. I'm just going to keep running like this till the slot's cut all the way through. Uh, once it's cut all the way through, then I'll bring you back in and we're going to start working on the, uh, on the offset here either side so to create space for the T-nut uh, flange. Now the shoulder in this T-slot has to accept the shoulder on the little T-nut. So I need to uh, come either side offset from this edge. Uh, 3 sixteenths on this side, 3 sixteenths on that side, and 300 thousandths deep. Unlock our Y. 188. So now I just have to touch off and make a few passes to 300 thousandths. And we'll back it up and uh, do the other side the same way. Because I'm only using half the end though, I'm just going to do 50 thou cuts. I'll make six passes. It's not a big deal. I don't want to climb mill, that's why I'm backing it all the way up. This is basically the procedure. I'm going to do this six times until I get 300,000 steps. I'll bring you back in for the last pass. Last pass on this side. We're at 250 right now. Axis. So taking up the backlash in that direction. Yeah, that's that's the edge there. So then we have to back it up by three sixteenths of an inch. There we are. So again, I'm just going to cut the other side of the slot just like this one. Nothing really different. So I'm going to pause it here and bring you back when the, pretty much when the slot's done. Now in the same way that I uh, cut this T-slot here, uh, I'm going to have to do the short one, and then I'm going to have to flip the material around and do uh, this one on that side of the vise. So there you have it. A little bit of deburring necessary yet. Uh, clean up around the edge. And then I can flip this over and... Uh, counterbore the tops of these holes. Yep, it should suit my purposes just fine. I mean, I know this is not the real way you make a T-slot, but I'm not buying a T-slot cutter. There we are. That's where the hole is located. Swap out the point. <coughs> Swap out the point here for a three quarter inch end mill. This may be a tad fast, we'll see. Zero. Yep, 
Yep, that will work just fine. You know what's really interesting with this stuff? Um, <clears throat> I wonder, I mean, granted I don't know what grade it is, I suspect mild steel, but it seems like there are hard spots in it and here and there. Uh, in this central uh, groove here, turns out I actually burned up a couple end mills just milling this, even though these two were completely fine. And out of these three holes, or four holes, these three cut like butter, and this one here I was chattering on the way in until I got about a oh, quarter inch down, and then it just, again, that one cut like butter, so... It's interesting to see the variability and hardness in this stuff. But again, I'm not entirely sure what uh, alloy it is. I'm suspecting some form of mild steel, but... The last thing we need to do before I can give this plate a try is I need to make some more T-bolts to go in these holes. I want to use all thread or ready rod or whatever you want to call it. It'll be easier to take a piece of three quarters bar or 20 mil and just make discs with uh, threads in them and then weld that, put a, a short chunk of ready rod through and weld it on the back side. Um, it'll be plenty strong for this application. I think this is going to be the most efficient way of doing this. As far as material, well, we're going to use some of our mystery metal tie rod end material. <clears throat> I'm sure it will be plenty good enough for what this purpose is. Five-ish, close enough. All right. Again, it's not like I don't care about precision. It's just sometimes things are close enough, as long as it works. The tap drill size for a 5 16 18 is a letter F drill. Here's my letter F drill. But I'm going to pilot drill first with a 3 16 Before I can do anything, though, I need to center drill it so that the drill starts accurately. we go, 5 16 18, a little bit of the fancy schmutz. I need to make the washer part itself 240 thousandths of an inch thick. The parting blade itself is 93 thousandths. So that means I'm going to have to move the whole carriage over by 333 thousandths. So I just put, I just got this dial here to read 333. So as I move away from the end of the material, once I bring it up to zero, that means now that I should have 240 thousandths from the end of the material to the edge of the blade. Which, yep, yeah, we're good enough. Well, it's peeling a chip at 60. There we are. 
So there's one of them. Yeah, there's a little bit of a burr on the back I gotta clean up, but I'll deal with that. So you've seen one of them. I'm just gonna make all four of them like that, and then I'll bring you back in once we're ready to mill the flats on them. They're 785 thousandths in diameter. The width of the flats needs to be 625 across, which is 160 thousandths, which means we have to take 80 thousandths off either side. There's 80 thousandths. That sucked. She grabbed. Okay. Well, what do you think this? Well, for those of you who were probably screaming, no, into the screen before, you were right. I shouldn't have taken 80 thousandths at a pass. Um, so, thankfully, this surface here isn't too bad. They'll still be usable. It's only the one that really got the worst of it. So, let's try this again, but we'll take lighter passes this time. All right, well, apart from the one that kind of got a little bit dinged up. Well, apart from the one there that got kind of got a little bit dinged up, I think that's uh, reasonably acceptable. Again, it's just cosmetic. It's not going to affect its function. So after facing off the ends of all the T-bolts, uh, just to get rid of any sort of excess weld uh, material I had, um, I find that they fit beautifully. In fact, I venture to say they fit a little snug, more snugly than the uh, original ones. Come on. Come on. There we are. And I'm just going to eyeball it straight for now. That is not going anywhere. Now, we're going to use this as our practice piece. Um, the thing about this piece is I know that I could put it in the chuck and turn it, no big deal. The piece I actually have to work on for a buddy of mine is like this, but it comes off and then has a bend up and sticks out that way, which unfortunately means I can't actually put it in the chuck. So this is what we're going to do. We're gonna have. I mean, it looks like for now I'm going to have to put longer T bolts in, but and I'm also going to have to shim it because we want to bring this up to the center line of the chuck. So I'm going to do some fiddling and such off camera. We'll bring you back in once I actually have it set up. It took a little while and <laughs> I will be the first to admit that this is not the most uh, quick way of setting up a piece of work. Um, again, because of the fact that I don't actually have any sort of adjustment up and down with some sort of screw mechanism, um, I had to take and shim underneath the workpiece with some pieces of bar and some flat... Uh, <clears throat> flat bit of sheet, uh, but that gets me, well, within a few thousandths of center line there. And uh, so we're pretty much in true center line to the uh, spindle axis itself. And yeah, I got it snug down with four toe clamps, um, some step blocks. It, <clears throat> again, it, lo it looks ugly, but it should work. And this is our little test. If this works, then great. Now, the thing I have to say ahead of time is I realize there are limitations to the rigidity of this. Um, I've already locked off the cross slide, uh, so it can't move this way. Again, I've tried to use as many toe clamps as I can. As far as the tool pressure itself, I'm going to drill in steps to try to minimize the pressure uh, from the tool. And as far as the threads are concerned, all I want is minimum couple threads in. And if I can get a couple threads in, then what we're going to do is we're going to take the bar that we're actually going to work on once it's threaded a certain ways in, so I know it's running straight, we're gonna pull the piece out that we're gonna be working on, 
and then put it in a big vise and then we can hold on to it with a much more secure um, much more secure reaction force to the tap wrench that we're going to be using because I'll be using the big one. Center drill it. Alright, that's, well, that's yeah, I think that's the end of our hole. Yeah, there's the bottom. Yeah, that's the bottom of the hole. If Murphy's going to come play Havoc, this is it. This is where he'll show up. Now I realize a lot of people over the years have done crazy things with lathes, but and I realize this is really nothing new, but it's new to me, so I think it's cool. I'm having fun. I'm not sure who all else is watching this. As long as Murphy stays away, then it'll still be fun. Oh, there's the bottom of the hole. Well, what do you know? It's a 7 8 14. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just giving a light feed with the uh, with the carriage to follow the uh, to follow the lead of the tap. Yep, I like that. I probably could finish off this hole if I wanted to, but I've done what I needed to do for what I wanted to do. So I'll consider that a success as far as a proof and concept, um, especially considering the fact that this lathe is still technically you know, hobbyist size, not really a commercial lathe by any stretch. I'm just tickled if I can do something like this on a lathe this size. Now one of the other fun things is I figured I'd take a measurement and from the bottom uh, or from the top of this plate to the center line we're looking about two and three quarters of an inch. You know right about there two and three quarters of an inch. So that means that as long as whatever center line of whatever feature on something large has to be um, put in as long as it's the center line is less than two and three quarters of an inch from the edge of something I should be able to you know slap it on here and clamp it down. That also means that anything, say, five and a half inches in diameter or smaller can be clamped here and run back and forth for even doing something, say, like a line boring operation. Well, for those of you who followed me for this entire process and my fiddling and farting around trying to, you know, make sure it fits and works, then thanks for hanging around. Well, I'm actually pretty tickled that that worked out. Um, <laughs> I was kind of worried about an earth shattering kaboom. Uh, but thankfully it seems to be working. It seems to be rigid enough for the purposes I need. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, I realize a lot of this stuff has been done before. I mean, the lathe, has, the engine lathe has been around for 150 years. So I don't claim originality in any of this as far as ideas. It's just, you know, a lot of this is just a variation on a theme. Somebody has an idea and you take that idea and adapt that idea to your equipment. So that's what this is. Um, if anybody found it interesting, great, you know, give me a thumbs up, awesome. Um, if you haven't already, subscribe, that'd be great. Uh, if you happen to have one of these ubiquitous 12 by 36 Chinese lathes and you'd like a copy of this, um, uh, copy of this plan, just email me. Not a problem, I'll email it to you, totally free of charge. It's, you know, other people have shared so many cool things with me through YouTube. Uh, all I, it's, it's all I can really do to, I want to be able to share it and, 
share it back into the system. It's really cool to hear from the different people from around the world who, who are wanting to come hang out in my shop with me. This is a lot of fun. So anyway, for what it's worth, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you all next time. Thank you.